Jesus had given each one of us a badge of distinction. This badge is to be worn by each one of us. Times will come when we will have to wear the Christian badge of distinction humbly. This badge has an inscription. On it, it is written the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is the Lord himself, and I can call upon him any time I wish. You see, Jesus had told us that men ought to pray and not to faint. And should I say to become prayerless is to be disobedient? Because he told us that we should pray how much? Always, and not faint. You see, to be in a state of fainting means to be lost of vital power. And the question is then, being without vital power, is it a good thing? The answer is no. And I'm to fill, I'm, and I'm to be filled with the Spirit at all times. I'm to be alive and well, having a spiritual connection with Christ. So when I don't flash that badge of distinction in my secret time, or in the times at work, or at home, or in church, we are left at a situation where we are completely powerless. Listen to this. A scientist was once doing a research to find out what was the most powerful thing upon earth. He thought maybe it was to launch the space rocket at the Kennedy Space Center, but that wasn't it. He thought maybe it was a nuclear bomb, but that wasn't it. At, on further research, he found out that you know what it was? It was prayer. And the saddest thing that he also found out is that the Christian doesn't know about it. They don't know that they have this power within their arms. As a matter of fact, many don't even believe it. They don't even feel anything about it. Take, talking to Jesus is a big drag. Talking to Jesus is a waste of time to some of them. It is a negative thing. But not so, beloved. Not so. You see, if we don't pray, we can't have that hedge that God had promised to be around each one of us. We are told prayer lifts us up. It takes us up to God. And our prayers are not supposed to be robotic and powerless. Prayer is a live connection with heaven. It is talking with the Savior in person. And he is empowering us when we call upon his name. You know, when we breathe that holy name in prayer, the Savior is right by my side. Remember when Jesus was in the belly? And the angel Gabriel was talking to Joseph in a dream? Here's what he said. Matthew, okay, here we go. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name, what? Jesus, for he shall save his people in their sins. From their sins. So that name, Jesus Christ, is salvation. And salvation means deliverance and victory. Amen? And since that name means salvation, deliverance, we must bring to many people as we can. And we can show them the victory in the name of Jesus. Beloved, the name of Jesus possesses that vital power that sinners can be saved. When deliverance has been achieved in the name of Jesus, Satan falls like lightning. Let me show you what I mean. Remember when Jesus was passing through Samaria? And they didn't come out to see him. And the disciples were upset. 
But we're not talking about that time. We're talking about the time that after that time, he passed through a village. And when he came to them, they wanted to follow him. And Jesus permitted them to follow him. And then look what happened. Here's what the Bible says. Luke chapter 1, verse 1, 2, and 3. And after these things, the Lord appointed, appointed other 70 also and sent them two by two before his face in every city and place whether he himself would, would come. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways, behold, I sent forth as lambs among wolves. And they went. And look at the report that they brought back. Verse 17, same chapter, Luke chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Look at the report. And the 70 returned again with what? Joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Verse 18, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as what? Lightning fall from heaven. Many of us are like them. When we bring deliverance to people or victory to others, we feel so good about it. We feel we want to take the glory when we have flashed the name of Jesus Christ. But that glory belongs only to Jesus. You see, when you pull out that name, miracles will be wrought. And it will also bring happiness. But we must not take the glory for ourselves when God has manifested his power through us or even given us success in our work. We must remember with Christ, without Christ, I can do what? Nothing. Beloved, they were happy. You see, they had, they had used the badge to cast out the devils, and the devils would flee. Many would be healed, but Jesus wasn't looking at it in this way. He saw it differently. He was looking into the future. Here's what he says in verse 20. Notwithstanding in, in this, rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because what? Your names are written where? In heaven. Do you see what the Savior was focusing on? He was looking way into the future when they would be in heaven with him. Because if our names are not there, that means what? We're not there. He was saying it in so many words. Guys, you're going to spend eternity with me. And look what happened that very hour. Verse 21. And 22, yes, verse 20, 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced, where? In spirit. And he said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and has revealed them unto babe, even so. Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. This is a good thing in the Father's sight. Now let's look at the story where it had been revealed unto babes. You can open up your Bibles. It's, we're going to follow along with me. It's going to be in the book of Acts, chapter 3 and chapter 4. We're going to talk a little bit about these two chapters. And when you go home, you can read a little bit more about these stories. You can do some Bible, Bible search on Acts chapter 3 and chapter 4. Let's go to Acts chapter 3, verse 1. And you could follow along with me because we're going to go from 1 until verse 6. But let's look and see. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the night hour. This is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask 
arms of them that entered into the temple. Did you know that the name Peter means the rock or the stone or the pebble? And John means Jehovah is a gracious giver. But let's look at verse 3 to 6. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him, looked upon him with John, said unto us, he gave, and he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I, what? None, but such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, what? Rise up and walk. Beloved, Peter and John knew how to deliver this man in the state that he was. They wanted to show him that to have the power of Christ in your life is definitely more valuable than silver or gold. Beloved, when Peter pulled out the Christian badge of distinction, or should I say, when Peter and John gave him the Christian joy here below, using the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and said, rise up and walk, when these words touched the feeble man, it was help helping the helpless. He realized that calling on Jesus, on the name of Jesus, it was asking Jesus to touch and heal this man. The Christian badge of distinction has so much power to restore, it delivers, it brings hope and joy and victory. His names bring joy and gladness. His name brings comfort. His name brings something else. Let's check it out. Continuing in the book of Acts. Verse 7 out, 8 and 9. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and what? Praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Yes, the name of Jesus brings shock and awe. Victory and deliverance causes people to praise God. This man was healed. He was now walking and leaping and praising God. The name of Jesus, it directs praise to God the Father. It will also bring attention to those who use it. Notice this in verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power, our holiness, or holiness, we have made this man walk. Beloved, Peter immediately decided not to take the glory for himself, but he decided to direct it to the Lord God. He was telling them that it was the name of Jesus that did it. It was not us. It was the name of Jesus that made this man well. It was the name of Jesus that made this man walk. It was the name of Jesus that made this man jump. It was the name of Jesus that caused this man to start praising God. How is it with you today? Peter continues. Look how Peter puts it. Verse 16. Acts chapter 3, verse 16. And his name through faith in the name had made this man strong, who ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him had given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. It is the name through faith, not just the name alone, but through faith. 
You see, beloved, faith performed the miracle that was Peter and John. Faith experienced the miracle that was the lame man. Faith comprehends the miracles in the believing hearers. Beloved, a while ago, Peter and John didn't have this kind of faith. Do you remember that? Remember, they couldn't cast out a man whose son had a devil in him. The man had brought his son. And they couldn't do it. They couldn't. Why? Because they didn't know the power of prayer and fasting. They didn't understand the character of Christ. They didn't experience it at one time of power. They did experience it at one time. Remember when they, was, when they were being sent out with the seventh day, how they saw the devils? But now what had happened to them? They had become faithless and unbelieving. Look at how Jesus put it in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20 to 21. And Jesus said unto them, because of what? Because of what? Because of what? Unbelief. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as what? As a mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence and yonder place, and it shall, what? Remove. And what? Everything shall be impossible for you. Nothing. I can't hear you. Nothing shall be. And nothing. How be it? What, what, what's going on here? What's Jesus saying? How be it what? This kind goes out by therapy. Think about it. Are we in this kind of a situation right now in the world? Are people possessed by the devil? And how do we try to re uh, relieve them? By therapy, medication. But what did Jesus say? Do you believe it? Wait, wait, wait. Do you really believe it? Notice Jesus was telling them that when a person is sick, we need to do what? Pray and what? Fast. Are we going to get sick? We're human beings. We're going to get sick at one time. Our prayer life has to become real. For our prayer life has to be mingled with faith. And if our prayer, prayers are not working, we need to fast. This is what Jesus told us to do. When someone is sick, we should feel concerned. We should make every effort to bring relief to them. All we have to do is call upon the master in faith and pray. And, it will, and, it, and it's not a one-time deal. We have to be like Elijah. How many times did Elijah pray for the rain? Seven times. He didn't give up. It was consistent. We cannot be weary with prayer, praying to the master. Our Lord does not sleep nor slumber. Let me read you something about uh, this preacher by the name of Leonard Ravenhill. He's, here's what he says. No man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and payers, but few prayers. Many singers, few clingers. Lots of pastors, few wrestlers. Many fears, few tears. Many in, in, interpreters, few intercessors. Many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. Beloved, I know and you know, we don't want to fail. We want deliverance. We want victory. We want salvation. Well, it's in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Prayer will cost us time. It will cost us strength. It will cost us energy. How much are you willing to invest? Remember, Peter the Rock and John, the gracious giver, were going to pray. They were going to spend time talking to Jesus, and they saw this lame man. Yes, the, yes, the man was healed. The crowd was stunned, and the news spread like wildfire. 
you would think that the message that they heard and that many heard would bring happiness to all, but not so. The message of salvation, deliverance, and victory will cause many of us to be terrorists in this world. Do you realize what kind of a situation you're going to be in? Let me show it to you. Many will be upset. Are you prepared? Look at what happened. Acts chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. We're going to spend some time now in Acts chapter 4. Here's what the Bible says. And as they spake unto the people, this is John and Peter continuing talking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Verse 2, being grieved that they had taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So here you see priests, captain, that means the soldier of the temple, and the Sadducees, that means church and state, came together. The church and state was grieved that they taught people in the holy name of Jesus Christ. Shouldn't they have been happy? Oh, yes, they should have been. Beloved, the lame man experienced the love of Jesus. God was getting the, vic the glory, but the priests and the Sadducees were grieved. God had placed Peter and John in this situation so that his name may be glorified. It will be so with many of us. Not that he wants to punish us, but he wants us to bring salvation and deliverance and hope and freedom to others. Verse 3. And they, this is the priests and the Sadducees and the elders. And they laid hands of them and put them, and, and, sorry, and put hold upon them the next day, for it was evening time. They're thrown in prison. Notice, preaching the name of Jesus will cause some of us to be arrested. Maybe with Peter's family, when they heard the news, you know what they probably said? In Peter's family? Daddy was going to church to pray. And they met a man at the front door. And Daddy and Brother John, they healed the man. And everybody was excited about it. And they started to tell everybody in the church that how the man at the front door was healed. And when the pastors and the leaders of the Adventist church heard it, you know what they did? They sent the police and arrested them and threw them into prison. This is the book of Acts. I'm not making up the story. Go and study it, brethren. I know we don't like to hear these things in church, but this is a fact. It is not a pretty picture. The Bible is saying, all who shall live godly shall suffer what? Persecution. Do you see what is going to bring the, about the persecution? Healing, teaching, and preaching in the name of Jesus. You know when you read the book of Acts chapter 5? You remember when Peter was walking and his shadow would heal many people? Do you remember that? Now you, can you imagine if you went to the Ottawa hospital or the civic and you had the power of the Holy Spirit, and you walked by in the hospital, and many people were healed, what would happen to you? Everybody started to get better. Those who have cancer, heart attack, depression, anxiety, everybody started, wow, brother, sister, you've made me well. Do you think that's going to be a good picture? How, it's going to be a good picture for those who believe in Jesus Christ, amen. But what about the doctors who have lost their jobs? You're laughing. It's going, to be, it's going to be real. This is going to be to us in the future. Because when you read Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and 6, this is what's going to happen. Because chapter 7, probation is closing for the Jewish people. Because they stoned Stephen and the gospel moved from Israel to who? Each one of us. So notice it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Continue with the story. They were upset, beloved. Let's look at it, verse 4. 
And they, how be it, verse 5, yes, verse 4, how be it many of them, when they heard the word believe, people are going to believe. And the number of them was about how much? 5,000. The Holy Spirit is being poured out. Beloved, 5,000 were converted. And this was not Pentecost. It was way after that. Peter and John called upon the name of Jesus. But they didn't stop there. They continued to teach and preach in the name of Jesus. Look at verse 5, 6 and 7. And it came to pass on the morrow that the rulers and elders and the scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together where? At Jerusalem. This was nowhere else. Jerusalem is the Adventist church. Continuing, verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked them, by what? By what? By what power or what? Or what name have you done this? Did you notice? It was in Jerusalem. It was not at Rome or anywhere else. It was in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Where is Caiaphas from? He's not from Rome. He's from Israel. He's the high priest. I want you to know that I'm not making up these stories. Do you remember when Jesus always questioned the leaders? He questioned them and he said, haven't you read? They weren't reading. He said, it is written. They had to go and search. Then he had to say to them, it wasn't so in the beginning. They weren't reading. Beloved, the name of Jesus will make many in the Seventh-day Adventist church join with the state. It would be like Ahab and Jezebel coming together. And they will start asking questions, by what name are you preaching by? By what power are you doing this thing by? Do you remember what Jesus had told them earlier? That they would be brought before councils? If we get the Holy Spirit by God's grace, we're going to be brought before councils. Do you know that? Here's what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 10. Jesus told him before. Jesus is a prophet and he was prophesying here. He said verse 17. But beware of men for they will what? Deliver you up to the councils. And they will what? Scourge you. Where's the synagogue? Okay. What kind of a church? Sunday church? Adventist church. Where are they going to beat you? I'm not saying it. Who's saying it? The master, they're going to deliver you and beat you in this Adventist church. And they and you shall be brought where? Before what? Governors and kings for my, what? My sake. For the testimony against them and the Gentiles. Jesus is going to bring us there so that the kings and the counselors can hear the good news. Don't you think he loves them? He does love them. He's going to bring the news to them. Continuing, but when they deliver you up, here's what he's telling you. Take what? No thought of how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be what? Given to you in what? The same hour right away what you shall speak, for it is not ye that speak, but who? The spirit of, the, of your father which speaketh in you. Now look how it was happening. Acts chapter 4 verse 8. Peter was filled with who? The Holy Spirit and said unto them. So who is talking here now? Is it Peter or is it the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit. Let's listen to what the Holy Spirit can say. Holy Spirit is speaking. Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Continuing, let's let the Holy Spirit speak. But before I go there, before I read this text, I wanted to tell you a story. This story wasn't about in the time of persecution, in the dark ages. A man was being persecuted, and he was brought before the king to recant. And the king said unto him, If you don't recant, 
I'm going to banish you from the kingdom. The man replied, you cannot banish me from Christ. For he will never leave me nor forsake me. Go ahead and banish me. The king got angrier and he said, if you don't recant, I'm going to take away your property from you. The man replied, my treasures are in heaven and you cannot touch them. I don't have any treasures here on earth. All are in heaven. You can take everything. I have nothing. The king said, if you don't recant, I will kill you. The man said, I've been dead for 40 years. Dead to this world and to the things thereof. And my life is hidden in Christ. And you cannot touch it. Beloved, Peter had betrayed the Lord. And he had wept bitterly and got converted. And he had died to self. And he was now living entirely for Jesus. So they had no fear of anything anymore. Look how they were speaking to the rulers as the Holy Spirit was using them. Verse 9 and 10. If we this day be examined for of a good deed done to the impotent man, and by what means is he made old? Verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand before you hold. Continue with verse 11. The Holy Spirit is speaking. This is the stone which is set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is salvation. So who is saying this? Is it Peter or is it the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit. So what is the Holy Spirit saying about our scripture reading? Neither is salvation in who? Any other name for there is what? None other name under what? Heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So who is the only Savior? Christ Jesus. There's no Savior in any other religious names. This is the voice of the Holy Spirit. He, the Holy Spirit, is saying that Jesus is the only way. The Holy Spirit was repeating John chapter 17, 3 verse 17 and 18. You know verse 16? What does verse 16 say? Let's repeat it together. For God so what? Loved the world that he gave his what? Only begotten Son, that whosoever what? Believeth in him shall what? Not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. Verse 17 now. For God did not send his son into the world to what? Condemn the world, but that the what? The world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he had not believed what? In the what? In the what? In the name of the who? The only begotten son of God. Beloved, this is not only about faith. They were rooted and grounded in the love of God. Doesn't the Bible say perfect love casts out fear? Oh, yes, it does. So if I have fear, then what has happened to love? It has not been perfected. Look how. They were grounded in love. Verse 13 and 14 of Acts chapter 14. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant. You remember they were fishermen, right? Did they go to school? Some of them. That was The only one that went to school was who? Was Matthew and um, Luke. And, but Luke was not one of the twelve. We're talking about the 12 guys. It was Matthew, and who was the most educated one? Judas. The rest were ignorant and unlearned. The Holy Spirit is writing it here. They were unlearned and ignorant 
They marveled. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with who? You see, when you go, when you're hanging out with Jesus, brothers and sisters, how do you become? You become bolder. You're rooted and grounded in love. And you become a caring person. Regardless of your education. And beholding the man which was healed standing with him, they could say what? Nothing. Beloved, when we are rooted and grounded in love, many will marvel. Many will take knowledge that note that we have been with Jesus. They will know that we have behold the face of Jesus and that we've become rooted and grounded in love. Love is so rooted and grounded in our hearts that we can be bold for the man who has borne our sins. We are going to live and teach and preach in that holy name. This will take courage. We are going to have to stand, but not on our own strength, but in the strength of Jesus. Now the rulers and the elders had a board meeting, and they sent them outside. Let us listen into the meeting. You know, sometimes we like to know what there's going on in the board meeting. You know, you like to know what's going on in the board meeting, even though you're not part of it. The Holy Spirit is going to help you now to show you what's going on in the board meeting. That's why you got to love the Holy Spirit. He can go places where you and I can't go. Look at verse 15 and 16. But when they had commanded them to where? Go aside, out of the council. They conferred among themselves. The board meeting is going on. Verse 16. Saying, what shall we do with these men? For that indeed a notable miracle had been done by them. It's manifested to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. This is in the meeting. They're coming up to a solution. Listen to the solution. 17 and 18. But that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. You see the board meeting? Did you see the board meeting? Beloved, can you imagine what's going on here? A man was healed who was lame. They passed by him every day. And now he gets healed. Instead of the rulers and the elders being happy about it, about this man who was leaping and praising God, they came up with a solution. The solution was to threaten and command Peter, James, and John, sorry, command Peter and John not to preach or teach in that precious name of Jesus anymore. They didn't want God around. What a sad thing. But let us continue. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voices to God with what? One accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them is. This is the first angel's message. They were thrown into prison, beloved. Because of Jesus. And they came back and they told the entire church of believers what was going on. Do you see the picture? And now they are praising God. They're praising God. And they start to thank God and be glad about what was happening. Notice what has been, prof Notice what has been prophesied about those who fight against God. It's Acts chapter 4 verse 25. Who by the mouth of the servant David has said, why does the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? You see what had happened? When they fought against the name of Jesus Christ because this man was healed, they are becoming what? What were they becoming? What are they becoming? Let's read it. They're becoming heathen. Do you know what a heathen is? What is a heathen? Unbeliever. Unbeliever. 
Verse 29. Let me speed up here. And now the Lord beholding their threatenings. This is, they're talking in the, in, the, in the church. And grant us thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. By stretching forth thy hand to heal. And that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus Christ. Christ child Jesus. And when they had prayed... The place was what? You think that can happen at the Nepean church? Wait, wait, wait. Do you think this can happen at the Nepean church? We all gather together. We decide to sing and pray and praise God. Do you think the place can be shaken? You think the neighbors will feel it? Listen to what happened. And the place was shaken where they were assembled together. They all were filled with the what? The Holy Ghost as they spake the word of God with fear. With reluctance, With fear. With boldness, brethren. With boldness. You want to be bold for Jesus? We have to pray together. Beloved, living in the name of Jesus, teaching it, preaching it. Yes, will cause many of us to be angry. They will become hidden. But notice the report. Once it came to those people, the church be believers were glad what had happened in the name of Jesus. They prayed with those who had passed through such afflictions. Here we see that prayer unites us. It's not meetings that unites us. It's not councils that unites us. It's not movie nights and game nights or outdoor activities. It's prayer meetings. I'm not hearing you. We read just now, how did the place shaken? By what? By what? Prayer. So what is going to unite our church? Are you serious? It will. This is a prophecy. We are, I know we are trying all sorts of things like the world. They're trying to do everything to get each one of us together. But the only way we are going to be together is by what? Calling upon the name of Jesus. And I'm the prayer ministry leader. I have to keep telling you this all the time. It is prayer that is going to unite us. Continuing. Aren't we living in a time where people are sick? You know, I was reading, I was reading my workplace. Let me tell you something before I, I, I'm almost finished. I was reading my workplace. If we continue to preach and teach, our work will cease. People are not going to listen to pastors much longer because they're tired of them. People are hurting. They're broken hearts. They're sick. They're in pain, misery. We're going to have to bring healing to them. When we bring healing to them, then we can tell them about the love of Jesus. When we bring healing to them, then we can tell them why we're 70 Adventists about the Sabbath. Many people are hurting today. Their houses are broken. Their marriages are broken. Their children are giving them back chat. Their children are rude. Parents are fighting with, with children. Husbands are fighting with wives. Wives are fighting with husbands. And we come to church and we sit down and we look so nice. Because it has happened in my home. I'm a living testimony of it. I'm not ashamed to say it. Me and my wife, we have arguments sometimes. And we go and we pray. And we forgive. And we love. And it's going to happen to each one of us. Our children are going to give us the hard times. We're going to have to pray. We're going to have to cry. We're going to have to weep. Because we love them. But we're going to have to correct them too. We're going to have to tell them we can't let them have their way. I know sometimes the kid comes around and says, Daddy, Mommy, Mommy, I want it. And you say, okay, give it to them. And next thing you know, they're rude to you. 
We're struggling, brethren. Our churches are struggling. Divorce is, is rampant in our church. And we're looking everywhere for solutions. If we could Google it, we'll find it. But it is in the book of Acts. Let me show you a text here. Chapter 4, verse 32. Notice this text. And the multitude of them that believe were of one heart. We all want to be of one heart. One soul, not two souls, not many souls. We all came together. Neither said any man that they ought of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. When the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out around, we are going to become caring people. It's not just preaching alone. It's not just preaching and coming and, and putting our tithes and offering. It's going to, God is going to make us become caring. Our families are struggling. If you as a wife today is struggling with your husband and your children, I want you to come forth right here. If you as a husband is struggling with your wife, please come. If you are a young person, you're struggling with school, and if I'm a father, I'm struggling with bills and car trouble and whatever trouble I have, I beg you to come, let us pray. We know the solution. The Bible says, in everything prayer, not in everything debates, not in everything discussion, but in prayer. Beloved, the prayer life of the apostles after Jesus Christ was no more mechanical. They poured out their hearts to God about it. They got to work. That is the fasting part, Isaiah 58. They taught their children. They preached the name of Jesus everywhere they went. They relieved the sick. They became caring men and caring women. The Christian badge of distinction was no longer on their chests. It was not in their wallets. It was on their foreheads right here. This is the message that Jesus had come to show us. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he had what? Anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Have you been brokenhearted before? To preach deliverance, salvation again, to the captives. Sin, to the captives. Sin has shackled each one of us. And recovering the sight of the blind. Some of us can't see the word of God anymore. We're so blind, spiritually blind. Some of us are literally blind. And to set liberty of them that are bruised and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Mothers and fathers, I know you don't want to come and pray, but that's okay. The Lord understands you. He knows you. Today, the General Conference of the North American Division had decided to call prayer and fasting on April the 7th of this year to pray for families. And Brother Maurice is going to lead out a session this afternoon, right after service, that we are going to gather every family to pray. If you would like to stay, you're welcome to do so. We're going to pray because we need it. We're struggling in our homes. We don't want to admit it. It's a shameful thing. But we're human beings. This is what the battle is about. We read in the New Quarterly, the great controversy. The devil is angry at each one of us because we reflect the image of God. So when he comes, I beg you, stay and let us pray together. I beg you, let us cry unto the Lord. He's going to heal us. He's going to lift us up. May the Lord bless you.